So Stephen, or Tim said my shirt looked a little like salmon this morning. And Stephen said, looks a little fishy to me, I don't know. <laughs> so that's, that's a joke for this morning. <laughs> hey listen, I got a word for you this morning and it comes from our daily Bible reading calendar. And um, I see this teaching as an encouragement and a warning to us both. And, um, you know, I hate giving warnings to people, but unfortunately sometimes it's necessary to wake us up a little bit and really get us to think about, you know, what our life is like and what we're doing. So um, if you see this teaching as a warning to you, take it seriously and then take it as an encouragement that we can do better, that we can um, really get sucked into God and to his purpose in our life and, and uh, his relationship with us. So this week we've been reading through the book of Matthew, and that's where I'm going to be sharing from. So if you'll open up your Bibles or your phone apps or whatever you have to Matthew 4, that's where we're going to begin this morning. And the title of this passage in my Bible says that Satan tempts Jesus. And I found this to be very interesting to me to see that. And in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, we're going to start there. And it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. We're going to stop right there for one second. Jesus was led by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. Now, I don't know about you, but this in my brain went like, what? The Spirit led Jesus to be tempted by the devil. And you're like, wait a minute, this is Jesus. But yet the Spirit led him to be tempted by the devil. I found it a little odd that the Holy Spirit would lead Jesus to that direction. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, right? You know, we, we read that scripture and I'm like, yeah, true. Wait, wait a minute. We, we pray that we would not be led into temptation, but here the Spirit is leading him. So why would the Spirit lead Jesus into temptation? This verse tells me that something was, it was something necessary for Jesus to go through or something to do. And we're like, how can that be possible? Ah, I'm glad you asked, Lewis. I'll tell you. Something had to something Jesus had to endure. Remember, at this point in Jesus' ministry, he had just started. He just started the ministry. He had just started. But this was something that he had to endure. If you study this passage some, some, you will come to find out that the devil was trying to discredit Jesus as the Messiah. So Jesus was just declared the Messiah at this point, publicly in his ministry. He was going about ministry, and the devil was trying to discredit Jesus, saying, this isn't the Messiah. You people all got it wrong. And by tempting him and trying to get him to fail, he thought he could expose Jesus as some kind of fraud. Because how many know when, when temptation comes your way and you're victorious in it, you're a person of your word, you're a man or woman of your word. But when you fail in temptation, people sometimes think of you as a fraud. He's not really what he says he was. And that was what the devil was trying to do to Jesus. He was trying to discredit him. He was trying to invalidate, that's a big word, but invalidate all that Jesus was supposed to be there for. And if the devil can get, remember this for you, if the devil can get you to fail, he will try to use that to discredit what Jesus has done in your life. Think of that for one second. If he can get you to fail, then is, is what Jesus really did in you true? Now, obviously we know it is, but do you begin to think differently about that? Well, maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's not. And people around you looking at you go, wow, he's not as strong as I thought he was. Maybe this, 
this Jesus thing that he's into, maybe that's not really real. The devil is trying to invalidate in you also what Jesus has done for you. He's just trying to expose you as a fraud. Just like the cross, this was something that Jesus had to do. Not my will, Father, but your will be done. I don't really want to die on the cross, but if this is your way, I will do it. Because it was a way that he showed people who he really was. And at this time in this scripture, Jesus is showing people who he really was. Sometimes when we, you or I, get tempted, we consider it immediately to be harassment by the enemy. We see in this scripture here, that this wasn't harassment by the enemy. It was something that Jesus had to go through and was being led by the Spirit. And it's important to see he was led by the Spirit, not Jesus just walked into the wilderness and said, Tempt me, devil! But the Spirit was leading him through this. Remember that when you go through temptation, that the Holy Spirit is there to lead you through that temptation. In this case, it clearly was not harassment, but it was something to show us that Jesus was genuine and also it was an example for us on how to live our life. We'll find that out in a minute. I believe that if we were alive to see the life of Job, maybe many of us would have thought, man, this guy is being harassed by the enemy. But if you read the scripture, you'll remember Jesus said, have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered my servant Kevin? Kevin's like, oh, man. Thanks, God. Really appreciate that one. In this case, God allowed Job to be tested and tempted by the devil. Now, this temptation to me was also another example by Jesus to show us that he knows exactly what we go through on a daily basis. You know, some people equivocate, wow, such a big word, I couldn't even get it out. Equivocate us, excuse me, Jesus, as this lofty, which he is, I'm not, please don't listen to me before we finish this, as this lofty thing who has no touch with reality. But yet we say, hey, Lord, I'm being tempted. And Jesus goes, I know, I went through it too. You can do this. You can be victorious in this. And let me show you how to do it. Jesus was to say, I know what you're going through. I know what you're going through, Brad. I know what you're going through, Tim. I know, and this is what you can do. And in the end, it was proof to us that we can endure temptation and be victorious. You have to remember that. You can endure temptation led by the Spirit and be victorious. I would say to those of you who are being tempted today by the devil, you're in good company. You really are. Take it as a compliment. I don't think the devil would waste his time with you if you were not a threat to his kingdom. I don't think the devil would give you a second thought if you were going along with the program. But the devil thinks you are important enough to try to take down, so he's going to try to tempt you. This passage made me think that if Jesus was led by the Spirit into temptation, that there must be a purpose for it when it happens to us. And I believe that temptation can be used to increase our faith, our perseverance, our hope, our endurance, when we are victorious. As a matter of fact, James chapter 1, verse 12 says this, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. I think of the life of Job, when we read the end of the story, and we saw what happened to him through the temptations, through the trials that he was put through, and how he was blessed for remaining steadfast. Some might be thinking, well, that's all well and good when we're victorious, Pastor, but 
What happens when we fail? There's a guy named Fred Brooks. Probably nobody's ever heard of Fred Brooks. But he was an American scientist and software engineer who was quoted as saying, we learn more from failure than we do from success. I heard it took Thomas Edison over a thousand attempts to make the first light bulb. And a reporter asked him one time, how does it feel to have failed over a thousand times? He says, I didn't fail a thousand times. He just says, I found a thousand ways not to make a light bulb. <laughs> because he continued to endure. He continued to persevere. He continued to, to work at what his goal was. You know, for most of my career, I was a, a training officer for the new police recruits when I came in. And I've seen firsthand in my experience how failure can be a good teacher. Listen, it's not some place you want to live. It's not some place you want to camp out. But failure can be a great teacher because it will remind you of what not to do in the future. You ever said, you ever gone through something and go, not going to do that again? <laughs> I watched a video yesterday where this guy from another country was walking through the West and they had electric fences for cattle. He goes, well, how bad can it be? And he fell on the ground. He didn't do that again. It only takes one time for you to put your hand on, this, on a hot pot on the stove, go, not going to do that again. Sometimes failure is a good teacher for us. You remember, not going to do that again. Some of you say, but Pastor, the temptation for me sometimes to sin and to go through some of these things is so unbearable. It's too great for me to overcome. Ah, but I have a scripture for you. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says this. It says, God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So you're telling me, Pastor, that no matter what temptation I'm going through, I am able to overcome it because he will not tempt me. He will not allow me to be tempted beyond what I can bear. That's exactly what I'm telling you. Because it says that the, the Holy Spirit will give you a way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. Man, there's a lot of things that we go through in life and you go, you've got to be kidding me. How could anybody bear that? There's a scripture. If God is going to allow you to be tempted in your life, then he's going to provide you a way out. So let's go back to Matthew 4 and see how Jesus handled the situation with being led into the wilderness. Verse 2 says this. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Obviously, the devil knew who Jesus was. And also tempted to do something that he knew he could do very easily. It's just bread, Jesus. Just make some bread. Make some stones. Make some bread out of these stones. Now Jesus had just fasted for 40 days. Obviously he was a little hungry. Anybody relate? I can't go 40 hours, let alone 40 days, right? My stomach is a grumbling. So after 40 days, I guarantee you his stomach was a grumbling. You think he was immune from the laws of of uh, physical nature and hunger? No. The devil tempted him with something so innocent in our minds. It's just bread, Jesus. Make yourself some bread. It may be innocent to you or me, but I believe that there is a reason why Jesus was fasting. And it wasn't just a show of his willpower. Why do we fast? Why was Jesus fasting? To humble himself, to deny himself, to become closer to the Father. And 
the enemy was just like, just make some bread, eat some bread, you're hungry, it's okay. There's little whispers we hear in our ears sometimes. It's like, shut up. Right? So what does Jesus say to the devil? Verse 4, he says this. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Why did Jesus respond like this? I find it interesting that Jesus responded with the word, with the scripture. He didn't say, get away from me, you little turd. Right? He said, he used the word, he used the scripture. Obviously, Jesus knew who the, the devil knew who Jesus was. Jesus responds with a scripture. He says, It is written that man does not live by bread alone. Jesus is teaching us something here. He combats temptation with the word of God. Very important to remember. Ephesians 6:12 reminds us that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Jesus is saying, this is how we combat temptation. Jesus knows where the battle is, and He addresses it properly. So let's see what happens next. Verse 5 says this, and then the devil took him up to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give His angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. The devil learned something from the first time that he tempted Jesus. And he goes, well, he's going to give me scripture. I'm going to give him a little scripture. For it is written. Wait a minute. The devil knows the scripture? Yes, he does. The devil uses the Holy Scripture to tempt Jesus. The devil says, hey, Jesus, it's written. That the angels, he gives his angels charge over you. Imagine the devil is trying to use scripture against Jesus. I found this fascinating. As Curly would say from the Three Stooges, what a maroon. <laughs> so Jesus says, verse 7, this. Hey, devil, it's written. Again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. In this conversation right here, I see a warning for us. And this is the warning that I have for you. Verse 6, in my opinion, is so dangerous because for us, many Christians don't really know the word of God well enough and can be tricked into believing the devil's words are right. Does... Does that really say that? Does it really say that that the 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 angels? Um, can you go back to that last scripture, Ann? He shall give his angels charge over you. Is that scripture? Yes. Is it used out of context? Yeah. Yes. yes. See the difference? It's subtle, but there's a difference. You're going to hear good things in your life. Man, my voice is getting really high. You're going to get go through things in your life where he goes, well, that's, that sounds scriptural. That, that sounds about right. He does say he'll give his angels charge over me. But it's completely out of context and not dealing with the situation at hand. Do you know the difference? Because the enemy is going to try to use those words to mess up your mind. Have you ever heard that game on the Christian radio, Bible or not? You ever heard that? They give you this nice saying or scripture and then they get contestants on there, is that Bible or not? 
And then people are like, oh, that's, that sounds about right. Well, unfortunately, it was from Buddha, you know? Well, that's, that sounds good. There's a lot of New Age stuff that sounds really good, sounds really kind of there, but it's not what it means. This is the warning. There are too many wolves in sheep's clothing out there trying to convince you that their opinion is good. Listen to me. This, this sounds right. Listen to me. And if you don't know the difference, you're going to be fooled by that. <clears throat> Problem is that many people think, say things that sound biblical, but are actually not. My encouragement to you this morning is that we need to know the scripture inside and outside and backwards and forwards and upside down. Let's look at verse 8. Because the devil doesn't give up and he tries again. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Well, the devil used scripture before, but he must have forgotten this specific one that he was talking about. Because the very first one of the Ten Commandments says what? You shall have no other gods, you shall have no other gods before me. Number one, devil. Listen, I might not know all this, the, the Ten Commandments and recite them in every second. But I know the first one. Some of you may say, hey, listen, I, I learned this back in, in, in Sunday school. I remember that first one is you shall have no other gods before me. Well, Jesus at this point must have been tired of him. And he says, verse 10 says, Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and, only shall you, and him only shall you serve. I want you to see something through this passage of Scripture. How does Jesus show us how to defeat the enemy? Does he say, Wayne, use your willpower. Steve, use your intellect. And use your strength to defeat the enemy. Luke, use the force. I've been waiting all week to say that one. You guys know that one? He shows us that it's the scripture that's going to defeat the enemy. It's the word of God that's going to defeat the enemy. You keep working in your natural, you're going to be butting your head and butting your head and butting your head and butting your head against the enemy and his temptation. And chances are when you get tired enough, you're going to fail. Use the Holy Scripture to combat the enemy. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. He showed us the way. He showed us the example. And after the devil was defeated, Jesus goes, Get away from me, kid. You're bothering me. Verse 11 says, And then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to Jesus. James 4, 7 reminds us of this. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Submit yourself to God. Resist. Active. Verbiage. Resist the devil and he will flee. Listen, this passage of Scripture reminds us that Satan is out there to actively try to get us to fail. Sometimes you tell your kids, don't you have something better to do? Well, the enemy has nothing better to do than try to get you to fail. This is his job. It's the whole point of his existence. To mess with you. Great. Just what I wanted to hear. Ah. But God is sovereign. He's in control. 
He allows. Why? So that we can learn things. So that we don't go around the mountain the second time. I don't want to go up the mountain the first time, but I really don't want to go around it the second time. Listen, there are people who have gone around the mountain 60 times. And you're like, man, don't go around that mountain again. Let's get it right this time. The enemy tries to get into our heads saying that this Jesus stuff isn't real. It doesn't work. He's a fraud. You're a fraud. Give it up. That's his whole goal. And you're going to say, nope. For the scripture says this, Satan. And I believe the scripture. Jesus said this, and I believe Jesus. God the Father said this, and I believe God the Father. He gets to try to show us that those things that are around us, the people that are around us, that Jesus hasn't worked in our lives by exposing our failures. Listen, look at some of the ministries in the news recently. And you wonder, did you really have a relationship with Jesus? Did he really change your life? Now listen, people look at that. We all fail. So we can understand that there are temptations that we fail in. The point is that the that you learn from that mistake and you not repeat it. Do you think unpeople saved, excuse me, unpeople saved, unsaved people look at those ministries and go, I thought Jesus was supposed to change everything. Looks like you act like I do. Looks like you failed the same things I do. Does Jesus really change anything? The enemy is out to attack us by giving us words that sound good but are out of context and not what Christ has for us. Be on guard. Be on guard for temptation and address it properly to defeat it the first time. You get tired of doing things in your own strength? God's like, I got a way out for you. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. No. No. I'm good. The Father has made a way out for you and He's not going to tempt you beyond what you're able to, to bear. He's given you the wisdom. He's given you the example of what to do. I pray that if you're going through temptation in your life right now that this word kind of sinks into you and you go, I'm going to do things a little differently the next time I'm tempted. I'm going to use the word to combat the enemy because it's so much more effective. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I pray this word really does sink deep into our hearts. And Lord, it, it may be serious for some of us. Maybe some of us have a handle on this and already know this. But Father, for those who don't, for those who are dealing with temptation, for those who are dealing with things in their life that lead them astray, Father God, I pray that this word would sink deep into our hearts. And Lord, that we would purpose in our minds and in our hearts to know the Scripture better, to know the Scripture backwards and forward and upside down and left and right, Father. Lord, I pray that as you allow temptation to come into our life, that as we battle it and become victorious, Father God, that it encourages us, that it gives us faith, that it gives us hope, and we know that this is real, Lord. And Father God, for those times when we do fail, Lord, I pray that that would be a marker for us that we would remember, I'm not going to do that way again. I'm not going to go down this road. I'm not going to approach this. And Father God, that we would make changes to our life so that we don't repeat that a second time. Lord, we do believe you are sovereign. We do believe you are in control. We do believe that you are the center of everything. And Father, if we submit ourselves to you and we follow your Holy Spirit, you give us a way out through every situation. 
Lord, we thank you. We are grateful for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.